Hello and welcome to a shortened seven days of science. Shortened, you say? Yes, shortened. The full episode is going to be uploaded to the new seven days of science channel. So go and watch that now. If you want to watch both videos, go for it. But if you have to go and watch one, go and watch it on the seven days of science channel because that's where the full episode will be. I realize I'm saying that as if it's a different channel to the one that this intro will be in because this intro will also be in the... Anyway, coming up in the news this week, a thing spins really fast. The biggest terror bird ever has been discovered and the oldest tadpole fossil has also been discovered. This episode has been brought to you by Curiosity Box, also known as probably the greatest Christmas present you could ever receive or give as a science lover. To see Ben, Amelia and myself excitedly unboxing the Autumn Box, check out our video on when arachnids ruled the earth. It's yeah, the body deck! The body. <laughs> it's the one I wanted! It's, <laughs> it's so cool! Do you want to come over there? So Starting off the news this week, a study published in the Astrophysical Journal has detailed the observations of a neutron star 26,000 light years away in another part of the Milky Way galaxy. Scientists are, of course, looking at stuff like this all the time. So, what's so special about this particular observation? Well, the neutron star in the 4U 1820 30 X ray binary star system is spinning incredibly fast. Now, all neutron stars spin very, very fast, but this one is one of the fastest spinning neutron stars ever observed, spinning at a frankly ridiculous 716 times a second. It's one of the fastest spinning objects ever observed, and it has a mass 1.4 times greater than that of our Sun. Neutron stars are incredibly dense objects, and so it's only, if only is the right word, 12 kilometers across. Like I said, this extreme neutron star is part of a binary star system, and the other star in this system is a white dwarf, which orbits the neutron star every 11 minutes, making this the shortest known orbital period of its type. Both a white dwarf star and a neutron star are, in a way, corpses of stars we more commonly see around the universe. Larger stars that aren't quite massive enough to create a black hole form neutron stars at the end of their lives, whereas stars such as our own will eventually collapse into white dwarf stars. A fascinating paper on what looks to be one of the most extreme star systems in our galaxy. In other news, a rather fun study published in the journal Franklin Open has evaluated the infinite monkey theorem and taken the infinite away, but made the finite a very long time indeed. The infinite monkey's theorem explores the nature of infinity and correctly states that if a monkey were to sit at a typewriter and press random keys for an infinite amount of time, it would eventually produce the complete works of Shakespeare. The point of this statement is to reveal what exactly it means to be infinite, and can also help us understand how probability works. Even things of extremely low probability can occur, and probability is a big part of quantum physics. This study sought to bring a numerical probability to the writing of Hamlet by a monkey typing randomly on a typewriter for the entire estimated duration of the remaining lifespan of the universe. It was found that it would take likely far, far longer than the lifetime of our universe for the monkey to recreate Hamlet. The calculations were also done using the entire planet's population of chimpanzees. That's around 200,000, each typing at a character per second. So pretty optimistic stuff. It was found that the chimpanzees will almost certainly not complete the complete works of William Shakespeare before the heat death of the universe. The probability being 6.4 times 10 to the minus 7,448,254. While this is clearly somewhat of a light-hearted study, it does show that some probabilities are just too great to seriously consider. And as for apes taking over human literature, as the study says, to quote Hamlet, Act 3, Scene 3, Line 87, no. First up in this week's very exciting paleontology news, a gigantic new terror bird has been discovered. 
It comes from a site in Colombia where terror birds have never been found before, and although it's only known from an incomplete limb bone, it quite possibly represents the biggest terror bird ever uncovered. It's not named as a new species due to how incomplete the fossil is, but it's definitely identifiable as coming from a member of the terror bird family, known as the forest rockets. Interestingly, it's also the northernmost occurrence of this lineage in South America, with previous discoveries of the birds mainly being from the more southern regions, plus Florida and Texas. The fossil itself is the preserved end of a left leg bone, and interestingly, it has some bite marks on it too. Although it's incomplete, the paleontologists estimate that this terror bird might have been more than 10% larger than Kalenkin, which is currently the largest named forest racket. They also estimate its body mass at a whopping 156 kilos, pretty massive for a bird. Not only does this new fossil possibly represent the largest ever terror bird, but it proves that these incredible animals were apex predators in ancient tropical ecosystems and helps us to better understand how they spread from South America into North America as the land bridge formed. Also in the recent news, the oldest tadpole ever has been discovered. Despite fossils of adult stage frogs being known as far back as the early Jurassic, and relatives of the frogs known from even earlier at the end of the Triassic, fossils of the tadpole stages of these animals have never been found in rocks older than the Cretaceous period. But that's changed with this new find from Argentina, as a fossil of a late stage tadpole belonging to a species that lived in the mid-Jurassic between 168 to 161 million years ago has been discovered. It's been identified as the species Notobatrachus degoistoi, which is what's known as a stem frog. Basically, it's classified just outside the group that includes all currently living lineages of frogs and toads. The fossil itself preserves some incredible detail, including the eyes peeking out from the rock, plus a sequence of vertebrae and its little hand. This fossil is important not only for being the oldest tadpole discovered so far, but also because it's the first tadpole of a stem frog to be found. It's also a fairly decently sized tadpole, at an estimated complete length of 16 centimeters, or just over 6 inches. The adults of this prehistoric species are also known to go pretty large for a frog, reaching 15 centimetres or 5.9 inches long. So it seems that tadpole gigantism, which is known in some modern species, was also present in these long extinct amphibians. This two-phase lifestyle in which the animals transform from filter-feeding tadpoles into their adult frog forms is therefore shown to have evolved a very long time ago, and has remained a successful life strategy among these remarkable organisms for at least 161 million years. Lastly, in the paleontology news this week, new research has investigated why prehistoric crocs never became specialised deep divers like some modern whales. During the evolutionary transition of whales from land-living animals to specialised swimmers, one of the things that changed was the anatomy of the air-filled sinuses in their skulls. These became modified to allow fluctuations in air storage to take place as pressure increases with depth underwater. The researchers therefore wanted to see if similar changes to the sinuses happened in the marine crocodilomorphs of the Jurassic and Cretaceous, the Thalatosuchians. By CT scanning the skulls of various species, they found that their brain case sinuses reduced over the course of their transition to more aquatic habits, like in whales. However, the sinuses in their snouts actually expanded. This possibly had something to do with draining their salt glands. These enlarged sinuses would have meant that they could not dive as deep as whales, so although both lineages convergently evolved to live in aquatic settings, the marine crocs never became quite as specialised for deep or open water life as the whales did. First up in the archaeology news, researchers have unearthed a rare dagger dating back to the Copper Age, the transitional period between the Neolithic and Bronze Age. The ancient copper dagger was found in the Tina Jama cave in the Italian region of Friuli Venezia Giulia. It's just under 10 centimetres long, about 4 inches, and is leaf-shaped. 
During the excavation, a structure made of slabs and stone blocks was also discovered at the entrance of the cave, dating from between three and a half and four thousand years ago. The purpose of this structure remains unclear for now, but fragments of human skulls found nearby suggest it may have had a function in funeral culture. Alternatively, it may have been built to shield the interior from extreme weathers. The excavation also uncovered flint arrowheads, long blades, and polished stone axes, as well as obsidian, stone and ceramic objects, and shell ornaments. These findings are not only rather beautiful and completely fascinating to look at, but are so, so important for understanding the technological, cultural, and social transformations in Europe during the Neolithic to Bronze Age transition. A fascinating archaeological discovery. Also in the news, the remains of a man found almost 100 years ago have been corroborated with a character in an 800-year-old Norse saga. In 1938, the remains of an ancient man were found in the well at Sverresborg Castle, but researchers at the time lacked the tools to do any in-depth analysis. Now, radiocarbon dating and advanced gene sequencing technology have allowed researchers to form a far more detailed picture of who this well man really was, rather than just being an early failed attempt at becoming a superhero. Using the ancient DNA retrieved from samples of well man's tooth, researchers could sequence his genome. Radiocarbon dating also undertaken confirmed the body is approximately 900 years old. Past studies published in 2014 and 2016 confirmed that the body belonged to a male who was between 30 and 40 years old at the time of death. The authors of this research used this ancient DNA data and radiocarbon dating to corroborate the events of an ancient Norse saga and discover details about the well man. A passage in the Norse Sverris saga, the 800-year-old story of King Sverre Sigurdsson, describes a military raid that occurred in AD 1197. During this raid, a body was thrown into a well at Sverresborg Castle, outside Trondheim in central Norway, possibly as an attempt to poison the main water source for the local inhabitants. This is the well man. The researchers were able to draw these conclusions about Wellman's ancestry thanks to a large amount of reference data from the genomes of modern-day Norwegians. The paper illustrates that this is the first time a person described in these historical texts has actually been found. A brilliant example of how advancing technologies can allow us to blend history and archaeology with science and can hopefully help us make more fascinating discoveries in the future. And finally for the news, researchers have published a study finding that intensive fishing of the seabed is releasing carbon. A method of fishing called bottom trawling is used around the world to catch many species of fish. This involves towing nets behind the boats along the seabed. As you can imagine, this causes significant harm to benthic habitats and resuspends more than 20 gigatons of sediment annually on global continental shelves. Normally, the seabed acts as a carbon sink, with animals living at the seafloor consuming the carbon and shifting it to deeper layers of soil by burrowing and digging, where it can be stored for millennia. Research has shown that sediments collected in areas with intensive fishing contain lower amounts of organic carbon than those with less fishing. In fact, computer simulations have shown that the carbon concentration in the seabed has decreased continuously throughout the past few decades due to intensive trawling, with soft, muddy bottoms being particularly susceptible. The disturbance of these sediments due to trawling causes carbon from the sediment's low oxygen environment to enter the water column, where there is more oxygen. Microorganisms, like bacteria, then convert it to CO2. This CO2 can be released into the atmosphere, adding to what's already there and negatively contributing to anthropomorphic climate change. Did I say change right? Yeah. All right. Well, that's it for this week's 7 Days of Science. I do hope you enjoyed and, as always, We'll see you on Sunday.